Good morning, Britain Christian Church family, and we want to welcome you to worship this morning. I was reading the Apostle Paul. He wrote to the folks in Rome, and he said how I long to see you. And I thought about all of you when I read that this past week, how I long to see all of you. This is like we're in a marathon, isn't it? You know, when you run a marathon, it seems like the miles just go on and on and on, but eventually you're going to come to the end. And when you arrive at the end of a marathon, there is such a feeling of exhilaration and appreciation for all that you've been able to accomplish. And I think that's the way we're going to feel. We're getting near. We're getting nearer to the end when we'll be able to be back together one of these days. And what a joyous time that's going to be for all of us. But until then, I'm so grateful for all of you who have jumped on Zoom Bible study calls, who've been part of the Sweet Hour of Prayer, fellowship groups for our youth and our children. It has been a great blessing to have the technology that we have made available to us so that we could still stay connected during this time when we are all apart. This morning, we are going to lift our voices and we're going to sing together the praises of our God. We're going to study God's word together as we get back to Nehemiah and we're going to celebrate communion with one another. I, I want to make one quick announcement. I want to thank you for your faithfulness. Those of you who have been giving, you know, typically when people are not in the church building, out of sight, out of mind. But for those of you who have been so kind and so generous to continue to give your tithes and offerings to Britain Christian Church and our ministry here, we really, really appreciate you. You can continue to give either by dropping a check by the church office or you can go online to BrittonChurch.com and click the Give section there and make your donation there. Thank you so much for your generosity and your kindness. Let's all pray together. Father, we are grateful for this opportunity to come together this morning and to worship you. Lord, to lift our voices and to praise your holy name and to huddle up around your word, Lord God. Your word is like honey to our lips. And we are grateful for this opportunity to study your word together this morning. Lord, we ask you to fill our living rooms, our bedrooms. Lord, fill us with your very presence. And fix our hearts and minds upon you. For you are our strength and our redeemer. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now let's lift our voices and sing with Lacey and Phil as they come to lead us in worship. Good morning. We are so honored that you would choose to worship with us. And one of the sweet things about this time for my family has been these Sunday mornings when we can gather our kids around us and sing. And it doesn't matter where we are. We don't have to be in church to worship. But it's just been sweet to have my kids around me hearing us sing worship while they're singing or playing. I want you to gather those around you this morning and join us in worship. Sing with us. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. The tender whisper of love 
Good morning. Despite isolation, last week was a home run, from my vantage point anyway. God is on the move. We saw it displayed with the baptism of David Gentile. And praise God, I hear story after story of how God is breaking down walls all over the world. Which means we have a lot of new believers who are living with a new purpose statement. And what is that purpose? Well, Paul, he lays out our purpose brilliantly in 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 17. He lays it out for new believers and mature believers alike. He says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old is gone, a new life has begun. Then down in verse 20, Paul tells us, we, as new creations, are Jesus' ambassadors. God is making his appeal through you and me. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. This is our calling, to help people come back to God and to tell them, verse 21, God made Jesus, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. You and I, we are God's ambassadors, and He has given us the message of reconciliation. This is one of our main purposes as believers in Christ. And communion is a wonderful ceremony designed to keep your purpose and my purpose before us. During this time, we're going to partake. We're going to take the bread and the juice, which represents God's broken body. He came to earth with a purpose, to help make you and I right with God. So during this time of remembrance, think on your purpose and let's mimic our Lord and Savior. Let's continue to share our hope with this broke and dark world. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your goodness. God, we thank you that you came with a mission. You came with a purpose. Lord, you didn't come to satisfy your own needs or desires. You came to be a ransom. So Lord, I pray that we would have your same mindset. I pray that we would live intentionally, day by day, putting our trust in you, sharing your hope with others, 
And Lord, I just pray that you would... Let's start over. I was so close. (laughs) 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 Now, how now, brown cow? How now, brown cow? (laughs) That was so close. Good morning. Despite our isolation, last week was a huge hit in my estimation. Easter was awesome. We saw that displayed with the baptism of David Gentile. And it's awesome to see God working throughout the world. Walls seem to be coming down. Lives are being changed. And as a result, there's a lot of new creations out there. People that are living with a new purpose statement. What is that purpose? Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he he lays out our purpose brilliantly for new believers and mature believers alike. He says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old is gone, a new life has begun. Then in verse 20, Paul tells us, we as new creations are Christ ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. That's our call, to help people come back to God. And to tell them, verse 21, God made Jesus who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Folks, we are Christ's ambassadors, and He has given us the message of reconciliation. This is one of our main purposes as believers And thankfully, we have this wonderful ceremony known as communion. It helps us to remember our purpose. It helps us to remember how God sent His Son Jesus to give His life so that you and I could be made right with God. And then it's a reminder for us to go and share that hope with other people. So as we take of the bread and the juice this morning, remember your purpose and let's follow our Savior. Let's share our hope with this dark and broken world. Pray with me. God, we thank you so much for this morning. God, we thank you that we can come together even if we're not in the same building. And God, we can worship. We can praise your name. And God, we can be reminded of our purpose. Lord, I pray that as we take this bread and juice, that we would just remember your sacrifice Remember how you reconciled us to you, and I pray that we would have that same heart. God, we thank you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to ask you to take out your Bible and turn to Nehemiah chapter 4 this morning as we take a look at overcoming obstacles. Overcoming obstacles. Do you remember just a few months ago, we were heading into a new year with bright hopes and big plans that this year would be better than the last. That was the plan after all, wasn't it? Every one of us were in agreement. This year is going to be better. I know it's going to be better. What in the world happened? I mean, it feels like we got hit by a truck and we didn't see it coming. We didn't see it coming at all. What is different about this trial that we're going through now than all the other trials that we've gone through? Well, the answer to that's easy. In times past, some of us were going through troubles. Some of us were having to deal with the trials of life. But in this trial, we are all in the same boat together. We are all going through this trial. So now the question is, how do we overcome not only this obstacle that we are encountering, but how do we overcome the obstacles of life? N.T. Wright wrote an article for Time magazine just a couple of weeks ago 
The title of the article was Christianity Offers No Answers About the Coronavirus. It's not supposed to. I love N.T. Wright. I really do. And I agree that you can't go to the, your Strong's Concordance and look up coronavirus to prepare for your next Bible study. But I do think that God's Word gives us great counsel and insight about how to deal with the obstacles that we come across in life. And this is definitely an obstacle that we've run into, isn't it? This morning, we're going to go back to our study of Nehemiah, the study that we were in before, before we had to take everything online. So if you'll turn to Nehemiah chapter 4, we're going to read the first three verses together. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, even a fox climbing up on it would break down that wall of stones. Well, just like you and me, I'm sure that Nehemiah felt like he had been hit by a truck that he didn't see coming either. It's been a while since we've been in our study of Nehemiah, so I, I really need to refresh our memory leading us up to this point. If you'll remember, Nehemiah came from Susa, where he was the cupbearer for King Artaxerxes, the king of the Persian Empire. Susa was located in what is modern-day Iran. Nehemiah had heard from one of his brothers about the horrible situation going on in Jerusalem. The wall was down, the enemies were able to come and go as they pleased, and the Jewish people, they were in despair. When Nehemiah heard the news about the horrible situation going on with his family members back in Jerusalem, he literally sat down and cried, and he fasted, and then he prayed. And over time, Nehemiah felt compelled that he needed to get up and to go to Jerusalem and help rebuild the wall. So he got permission from the king, and he left Susa and went back to Jerusalem. There in Jerusalem, he toured the city at night so that he could assess what needed to take place to rebuild the wall. And once he had gathered the facts, then he gathered with the leaders in Jerusalem. Well, Nehemiah told them what God had laid on his heart. And the people responded. In Nehemiah chapter 2, let's read together verses 17 and 18. Nehemiah says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me, and what the king had said to me. They replied, Let us start rebuilding. And so they began the good work. The people of Jerusalem embraced the outsider and said, let's start rebuilding. Let's go to work. What an incredible sign of God's grace. There were no finger being pointed at one another. There was no blame game. There were no us and them lines drawn in the sand against the one who had come from the land far away. They saw the wisdom of Nehemiah's plan. They recognized, they had confidence that God's hand of grace was upon them. And so they rolled up their sleeves and they picked up their tools and they went to work. Then, when we turn to Nehemiah chapter 3, we read about all of the people that worked on the wall. It's interesting because we don't read about civil engineers or heavy equipment operators or stonemasons. They were priests and perfumers. They were merchants and goldsmiths and pharmacists. They were citizens of Jerusalem who lived in the urban center, and they were men and women who came from suburbs surrounding Jerusalem. They were all in it together. It was all hands on deck, and they worked with laser focus. It must have been an incredible sight to see. Things could not have been going better for Nehemiah. They could not have gotten off to a better start in their work on the wall. And then, why then trouble came around. The first obstacle came Nehemiah's way. 
And Nehemiah's first obstacle came in the way of Sanballat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite, Geshem, the Arab, and the people of Ashdod. Now, Sanballat was the governor of Samaria, which was just north of Jerusalem. Tobiah was the governor of Ammon, to the east of Jerusalem. Geshem was the chief of the Arabs, which was south of Jerusalem, and the people of Ashdod, they lived west of Jerusalem. So you can see all around Jerusalem, Nehemiah and the people of Jerusalem were surrounded by those who did not want to see the project of the rebuilding of the wall succeed. They wanted to see it fail. And we'll see in our study that they were willing to do everything in their power to make sure that the wall project would not be completed. Sanballat was the ringleader of the group, and he launched his first attack in the first two verses of chapter, of chapter 4. His first attack was ridicule and mockery. Nehemiah, who do you think you are? The people of Jerusalem. What are you trying to do? Words are powerful. Words sting. Words can discourage us and beat us down. The old adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Why, it's just not true. It's not true at all. The messages that others feed us and the messages that swirl around in our own heads, they can be some of the biggest obstacles that we have to deal with in life. Take a look at verses 1 and 2 in your Bible. I want to pull, there's five sayings of Sanballat there that are aimed at Nehemiah. What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? And then we read in verse 3 that Tobiah was right by Sanballat's side. And of course, of course he had to throw in his razor-like ridicule as well. Sanballat said, what they are building, even a fox climbing up on it would break down that wall of stones. Several years ago, the New Yorker film critic David Denby wrote a book called Snark. And in that book, Mr. Denby's book, he highlighted the way that our modern day discourse in politics, in social media, and in, in media itself, has set its sight on erasing a person's effectiveness and undermining their image in the public. Well, Sanballat and Tobiah were light years ahead of their time in the way they tried to undermine Nehemiah's authority. Sanballat and Tobiah, they were going to do everything in their power to make sure that Nehemiah and the people of Jerusalem would not be successful. How did Nehemiah respond to those snarky comments coming from Sanballat and Tobiah? Well, take a look. In Nehemiah 4, verses 4 through 6, Nehemiah prays, Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all of their heart. Did you notice Nehemiah didn't get into a Twitter battle? He didn't get into a battle of words with those who wanted to discourage him, and neither should we. Neither should we. Nehemiah took his concern to God in prayer. And I bet Nehemiah's prayer, as I read Nehemiah's prayer, and as you read it with me, I bet you were shocked at the contents of Nehemiah's prayer. Some of you may be thinking, you know, Nehemiah was too harsh. He should have been praying for Sanballat and Tobiah. Or, or maybe he should have invited them over to his house for dinner so that they would have understood he was really no threat at all. Well, maybe. But I want us to stay focused on how do we overcome the obstacles of our life. Nehemiah prayed, and then he went back to work. Look at verse 6 again. After he prayed, immediately we read, So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all of their heart. It is important for you and me when we encounter obstacles in life, whether they be people who want to discourage us and distract us, 
or experiences like the one that we're going through right now. We must stay focused and not give in to the negativity of those around us or the negative thoughts that can rule and ruin our own minds. Nehemiah and his friends, they went back to work. The concerns didn't go away, but they took it to God and they went back to work. They stayed focused on the mission. I want you to notice that even though Nehemiah prayed, the opposition didn't go away. And as a matter of fact, Sanballat and Tobiah, Sanballat and Tobiah and their buddies, they took their threats to a whole nother level. In Nehemiah 4, verse 7 and 8, when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone on ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They were furious. They were livid. They all plotted together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to stir up trouble against it. They were no longer tossing word grenades and firing mortars filled with ridicule and mockery. They were planning their assault on Nehemiah and the people of Jerusalem. I want you to notice Nehemiah's response. In verse 9, But we prayed to our God and we posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Nehemiah's course of action is so helpful to me. And I hope it will be helpful to you as well. Some of my more spiritually minded friends, they would say that Nehemiah didn't post a guard. He didn't need to post a guard. Nehemiah should have just prayed and trusted God to take care of the obstacle, the obstacle of Sanballat, Tobiah, and their buddies. Well, I want us to shift our focus just for a minute. From Nehemiah to the obstacles that you and I are facing right now. As I said earlier, we are all in the same boat together in this situation because of the limitations that have been placed on us because of the coronavirus. And yet, there are differences in our individual predicaments right now. Connie and I, we don't have kids at home with us. Our kids are grown. Some of you, you now have your kids with you 24-7, and it is exhausting. Connie and I, we... Um, are, our, our kids are grown, so we're not having to teach them. Some of you know that you're not teachers. You've not gone to school to learn how to be a teacher, and yet, right now, you are a teacher. And it's overwhelming. It's absolutely overwhelming. I told Trey and Irvin and Ryan and Jessica this past week, if this coronavirus would have happened when my kids were young, we would have had five periods of P.E. every day. I'm so thankful that I have a job to go to every day. But for many of you, you've been furloughed. Some of you have even lost your jobs, and your situation has changed. Your money situation has become very tight, very fast. Some of you are in the high-risk category, and you, you're having to be very careful. You can't be reckless because you may become infected. And there are many other obstacles that you and I are facing right now. Some of them coronavirus related and some of them not. But we can learn from what Nehemiah did in his situation and apply it to our situation right now. He prayed and he posted a guard. Notice that Nehemiah always begins with prayer. Oswald Sanders or Oswald Chambers, he wrote in his book, My Utmost for His Highest. We tend to use prayer as a last resort, but God wants it to be our first line of defense. We pray when there's nothing else we can do, but God wants us to pray before we do anything at all. And after we pray, God will give us wisdom, wisdom to act. I lost my job because of the current situation. So I prayed and I asked God to open a door of opportunity for me. And then I went out and started filling out applications and looking for jobs. Now that's wisdom. That's wisdom. You say, I'm not a teacher. I wasn't any good in school. And now I'm, I have become my child's teacher and I don't have a clue as what to do. So I prayed and I asked God to give me wisdom. And then I remembered a friend of mine who's been a teacher for many years, I called her and she's been an incredible help. Now that's wisdom. That's wisdom. When we pray, God gives us wisdom as to the next step. 
That's the promise of God for all of his people. James wrote, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. You see, Nehemiah prayed, and things went from bad to worse. The obstacle that he had been facing were, was coming from those outside of his community, from the Samaritans, the Ammonites, the Arabs, and the people of Ashdod. But now, as we continue in this story, we see that his own community, those who are working on the wall, they're becoming disillusioned. They're becoming discouraged because of the constant attacks. In verses 10 through 12, we read, Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out. And there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, over and over again, wherever you turn, they will attack us. The obstacles weren't going away. The obstacles were piling up on Nehemiah. And there will be times in our lives that the obstacles will seem to multiply and become immovable mountains. Even though we are praying and we're staying focused on seeking God and trusting Him. I know there's a popular teaching that's been circulating among God's people for a long time that teaches that if we will just have faith, if we will just have enough faith, then God will remove all the obstacles from our life. You like money? Well, claim your blessing in Jesus' name and the check is in the mail. Or you're sick? Are you, are you suffering from sickness? Then just get your brothers and sisters together and you claim your healing in Jesus' name and you'll no longer need a doctor. Name the obstacle, claim the victory, and if you have faith, it'll be done for you. I know that teaching all too well because I've had so many friends of mine who have had their faith wrecked on the rocks of the name it, claim it teaching. The Apostle Paul, he told the church in Corinth that he had a thorn in the flesh and that he prayed three times that God would remove it. We don't know, we don't have any idea what that thorn in his flesh was, although we do know that it was not a literal thorn. There was some obstacle that Paul was having to deal with. There was something going on in his life that he would have liked to have put behind him. And yet he told the people in Corinth, and he speaks to you and me this morning. Three times, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults, in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then he is strong. You see, Paul was able to see the power of the risen Savior in his weaknesses in his suffering, in his hardship. And in doing so, he found strength. And he, his strength was found in his dependence upon the Lord. And the same is true for you and me. When Nehemiah heard his people's complaints, when he saw them becoming disillusioned, distracted and despairing, he told them in verse 14, Do not be afraid of them. Remember him. Do not be afraid of them. Remember him. Him who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. You see, the people have shifted their focus from the work that was before them to God's hand of grace that was upon them to the enemies and the rubble that was all about them. Nehemiah said, don't be afraid of them. You remember him. God's word is such an encouragement to us, isn't it? I mean, as we read these stories of men and women of, of, of God that have gone before us, we see ourselves much more clearly. 
Those who were now complaining and who had become discouraged, they were the same ones that were so excited and passionate because they saw God's hand at work when they started to work on the wall. They were excited and passionate until their problems came, until difficult times came. Those who opposed their work, they were relentless. And the work that was before them, clearing the rubble and rebuilding the wall, it was tiresome. It didn't look like they would ever get that rubble moved out of the way. And all of that combined together began to weigh heavy on them, and they lost sight of the opportunity that was before them. I know many of you that are watching me this morning. I know how much you love the Lord. I know how committed you are to serving him in any way possible so that others might know the good news of Jesus Christ. But what happens? What happens to our love and devotion when difficult days come our way? What happens? What happens to our passion, our passion for the Lord, when problems of life just seem to persist? They won't go away. They're relentless. Well, we get distracted like the workers on the wall, don't we? The more we focus on the obstacles... Please hear me in this. The more we focus on the obstacles, the less aware we are of God's presence and his promise to provide for us everything that we need. It's in times like these that we must remember Nehemiah's words to the workers. Don't be afraid of them. You remember him. Remember him. Well, we're almost out of time this morning, but before we go, I want us to remember the power of remembering the Lord. That's what I want us to do. The power of remembering the Lord when we face the obstacles of life. When the cares of life weigh us down and the obstacles that we encounter are wearing us out, we must remember, we must set our minds on the Lord. And what is it that we're to remember? I'm so glad you asked. Scripture will provide the answer for us. There are two things that we are to remember. First, we are, re- we are to remember who our God is. Who is a God like you? We read that phrase over and over again in God's Word. And do you know, every time you read it, who is a God like you? The person who wrote it then begins to describe the character of God. You are holy. You are righteous. You are full of compassion. You are merciful. You are faithful. And we need to remember that when we go through these difficult times. God will not abandon us. He is full of mercy. He is, just as he has been faithful to those that have gone before us, he is faithful to you and me, my friend. And the second thing that we need to remember is we need to remember the way the Lord has worked in the lives of those that have gone before us. Not just to remember the character of Almighty God, but to remember the deeds of Almighty God and the way that He has worked in the lives of those that have gone before us. If you'll look at Psalm 77, verses 11 through 13, we're going to read one more verse before we get out of here. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider, I will think about your works, and I will meditate on all of your mighty deeds. You see, to meditate on God's mighty deeds, it's not just a glancing thought. It is to fix our minds upon what God has done. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? Let me close by telling you a story. Yesterday, I was driving when I got a phone call from a friend of mine who's in California. She's gotten some bad news from a doctor. She, um, she thought that things were going to be easier than they, than they are going to be, it looks like, in the future for her and her health situation. And she said, Mike, I get so afraid, so frightened. And so we began to talk. I'd been studying Nehemiah all week long. I said, let me ask you a question. Has God been faithful to you in the past? Oh, yes. So many times. I said, tell me, how? And she began to recount some of the ways that God's been faithful to her in the past. 
And I said, if he's been faithful to you then, he will be faithful to you now. Let's stay focused on him. You see, the obstacles of life come in many forms, but we will all face them. But we will not all face them the same. For some of us, the obstacles will absolutely paralyze us, terrify us, rob us of living life. But for others who place their trust in Jesus Christ, we, like Paul, will say, okay, here's the obstacle. Lord, I trust you. Lord, I'm going to follow you. Lord, I'm going to cling to you to see me through the other side. Where are you at this morning? Are you being immobilized by the obstacle you're facing right now? Or is God using that obstacle to draw you into himself? For he will give you strength. For he will give you strength that you've never known before. This morning, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you've got to know that's the first step. You can't trust God unless you surrender to him. Unless you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. So I want to invite you, if you would like to ask Jesus into your heart this morning and to begin to allow him to lead you through life, I want to ask you to pray with me right now. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. And Lord, your word has touched my heart this morning. I need you, Lord. Pray that prayer with me right now. Just say, I need you, Lord. Lord, I need you. Lord, I confess to you that I've lived my life the way I've wanted to live it. But this morning, I want to surrender my heart to you. Lord Jesus, would you come into my life? Would you be my Lord and Savior? And would you give me a passion to know you more and more each and every day? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God's word says that if anyone is in Christ, they're a brand new creation. The old has passed away and all things have become new. If you've prayed that prayer with me, I want to invite you to give me a call. You can call me at 405-408-4598. Nobody will answer that phone except for me. I would love to visit with you about how to begin this new journey in walking with Jesus. God bless you. Have a great week. I can't wait until we are together.